Hello and welcome to the Career Speakeasy, a casual, fun, and irreverent place to share ideas about career development, the world of work, and life in general. I'm your host and proprietress, Kelly Nottingham. Growing your career should not be boring. So come on in, pull up a chair, and pick your poison. My husband works in a heavy industrial environment. Now, I've worked in heavy industry as well and have a lot of love for so-called blue-collar people and the work cultures they create because they're so different from the medical and white-collar industries I've also worked in. Now, his work vocabulary is also way different than mine. And just by virtue of being around him for years, I've adopted words of his without realizing it that my white-collar colleagues do not understand. One day at my previous job, I mentioned that someone was about to drag up and I just got confused looks from my colleagues. Now, drag up, for those of you who are not familiar with this term, means to basically quit, to just walk off a job. I had picked up this vocabulary from him without realizing it. I've heard of this happening with American toddlers and I'm assuming also Canadian toddlers who watch Peppa the Pig and pick up an English accent, which is adorable. And if this is the case with your child, please, please send me an audio clip of that because so cute. So why am I telling you this? Humans have a natural tendency to mimic. It's part of our human DNA to help us socialize with other humans, to function within a society. We naturally mimic what we see and hear happening around us. Because we naturally do this, it's that much more important for us to be aware that we're doing it. We're mimicking what's going on around us to some degree all the time. So if you're surrounded with negative behaviors or with negative people, you've probably seen how this can rub off on you and it's contagious. Others will pick up on your negative behaviors and spread them around like poison ivy. Likewise, if we surround ourselves with people who exhibit optimism or who desire to learn new things, we'll naturally pick up on that as well. Parents who read books are more likely to have children who read books. If we're unconscious to the fact that we're taking on others' behaviors, we take away control over a major aspect of our own growth. When we do this mindfully, We take back that control and can make much bigger strides in our own development. So today's episode is going to focus on this topic, studying other people's best practices and consciously applying them to our own lives to see what works best. We're going to do this through a two-level approach, the mimic and model. So let's start off with defining what I mean by mimicking and modeling. Mimicry in the psychological world, refers to the unconscious and unintentional imitation of other people's behaviors, like picking up Peppa the Pig's accent, or picking up speech patterns, or gestures, or mannerisms, or moods, or emotions of other people. Developmental psychologist Albert Bandura defined behavioral modeling this way, quote, the capacity to learn by observation enables people to acquire large, integrated patterns of behavior without having to form them gradually by tedious trial and error. End quote. Now, in this episode, I'm defining these terms a little differently. Please, psychologists who might be listening, please don't send me hate mail. We're going to learn ways to do these two things mindfully. We're going to mindfully mimic and then take it to the next level by mindfully modeling. Our new way of thinking about mimicry is this. We're going to bring this from the unconscious into a conscious imitation of someone else's behaviors, speech patterns, bodily gestures, mannerisms, etc. But don't worry, we're not going to be creepers about it because we're not going to stop there. After all, we want to be a better version of our own unique selves, not a sadder, blurrier photocopy version of someone else. So we will mimic and then we will model. So if mimicking is copying exactly, then mindfully modeling is taking those lessons learned from the mimicking phase and 
building them out into your own new way of doing things. So one way to think about it is this. Mimicking is trying on someone else's outfit, seeing where it fits well, where it's a little tight, where it kind of chafes, where it doesn't fit at all. Modeling then is modifying and tailoring that type of outfit to fit you better. It's taking the best parts and keeping them and either tweaking or getting rid of what doesn't work. In other words, this is a way to experiment. We're trying on someone else's best practices to see if they fit us or not without hopefully experiencing a massive learning curve that we'd go through if we were trying to figure it out completely on our own. Now, the key piece to this, the point of mimicking and modeling is not to create a mini-me of your hero, but to try out different behaviors to see what you like what works and what doesn't. So you're not recreating the wheel. The goal is to say, how has this person done this thing successfully that I can learn from? Now, one of the most beneficial aspects of developing yourself through mimicking and modeling is this. You're learning from someone else's experiences, successes, and possibly their failures. And you're giving yourself an opportunity to break out of your factory default settings. What do I mean by that? So your factory default settings, as I like to call them, are the way you do the things you do. It's your approach to work, to relationships, to washing your dishes, to doing everything you do. I call them factory defaults because they've been in your system for so long, you probably aren't aware of them or where they came from. And it's often hard to see them when you're working on making changes for yourself. This is actually why feedback from a third party can be so helpful because others will see your factory default settings and help you become aware of them. But studying other people and seeing how they do things can help you with this as well. So here's an example in real life. I was, several years ago, part of a writing circle for a little while, and someone gave a great suggestion to improve writing skills, to learn how to write the way a successful writer does. So, if you want to become a better writer, they said, look at other writers who are already successful and whose work appeals to you. And before you try to sort of interpret lessons that you can learn from them, you literally copy their writing. Now, I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan. I have been all of my life. And so I used Agatha Christie as my example. I sat down with one of her books and literally typed out a page or two of one of her books onto my laptop. Now, this is the mimicry part. This exercise taught me more about her sentence structure, how she used adjectives and cadence, and how she built characters through dialogue than I would have ever learned just by reading her work. Now, there are lots of avenues where we can take this idea. So let's say public speaking. Maybe you listened to somebody's TED Talk and you weren't exactly sure why you enjoyed it so much. Maybe you chalked up their abilities to a general, they're just really good at it. Well, that's fine, but it's not going to help you become a better public speaker. So to mimic, you can get a copy of a speech or transcript of their TED Talk and speak it out loud to understand how they put their speech together, to learn their pacing, their storytelling process, and so on. You can even mimic their gestures if you have a video of them. Then you go to that next level. You build out your own model for public speaking, created from a blend of what that mimicking taught you and your own approach and what feels right for you. You're not mimicking anymore. You're now building on the good and the bad and the awkward that you got out of the mimicking process to make something new and uniquely your own. That is the modeling part. Now you can look at how someone leads meetings, how they network, how they lead others, how they deal with conflict or difficult conversations, the way they interact with other people, the way they email, the way they communicate with brand new people the way they give feedback, the way they manage a project. This type of mimicking and modeling is kind of like incognito mentoring, if you want to think of it that way. Now, you can potentially build a relationship with the person, 
Uh, but if you don't have access to them, let's say that maybe they're out of your price range or maybe someone who's passed away, you can still learn a tremendous amount from them by mimicking and modeling. You're mindfully studying what you like, what you don't like about the way someone else does something and what specific techniques do you want to absorb into your toolkit as options for success? It's really a way to find new ways to do things that we may not have tried before. Now, how do we do this successfully? The fastest way to frustrate yourself with this whole exercise is to try to focus on everything at once. Pick one thing, one thing, not all of the things, one thing. The best way to pick one thing is to be really specific about what we want to learn. Let's say you have a person you look up to and you want to be successful like them in their career, or I admire their confidence. Now, sometimes when we look at someone else's life experience, we aren't being really specific enough to learn anything useful. We need to identify some key specific questions about what we admire before we just jump right into observation. When we're specific enough, we know what to study and what to observe. Now, we're basically using this person as a case study. So if you've ever done a case study or you've ever done a lot of research, you know that you need to be crystal clear with the questions that you're asking and what you're going to observe. You don't go into a research situation with no idea of what you want to measure, what you want to study, or what questions you want answered. You'll either get no answers at all, or you'll get really misleading answers. Maybe you say to yourself, I admire this person's public speaking presence. Now, if you stop there, you're going to struggle. But you don't want to go so deep that you're trying to automatically give yourself the answer. You're just trying by asking some questions to give yourself a ballpark of what you want to explore. So, okay, I admire this person's ability to own the room. What specifically are they doing? How are they accomplishing that thing? When you start getting really specific, you get into observation mode. What are their behaviors? What words do they use? What postures do they use? What eye contact or gestures do they use? Now, you may have multiple ways to study. You may have DVDs. You may have videos on YouTube. You may have opportunities to observe in person. You may have one-on-one chances to chat with this person. Whatever opportunities and ways to study them that you have, go with it. But be open-minded about what the answers are. There may be things that they're doing that you might not be looking for that are causing the results that you aren't consciously aware of. This is again where those factory default settings come in. This is where I'd like to introduce the idea of a behavioral ecosystem. You want to ask a specific question, but look at every variable in that behavioral ecosystem that might be contributing to the answer. Now, in a professional example on an office setting here, a person who I admire that I worked with a lot was managing a massive project and he's very successful. He's very good at his job. Now, my questions when I was observing him was, how was he getting buy-in when he was disagreeing with the C-suite senior executives of the organization? How was he convincing them to his point of view? Now, at first, when I was looking at the situation as a whole, I was just wondering, like, how was he successful as a project manager? And I feel like in certain aspects, I'm struggling a little bit. When I started getting into those questions of how is he getting buy-in when, when there are disagreements, how is he convincing them to his point of view, I was able to really start digging down a lot further. What was happening was I was not having a lot of luck with one particular senior executive, and I couldn't figure out how I could do things differently to get a different result. Now, I was able to observe my colleague during meetings with this executive. I listened to how he spoke. I listened to how he fielded questions. And I actually just straight up asked him, 
How are you preparing for these meetings? What are you sending to this executive information wise ahead of time that seem to be working to get him to agree with what you're trying to do? What format are you sending it in? So I was looking at as much of the ecosystem as I could get to get a full picture of this colleague's actions, his approach, and his results. Now, what's interesting is that I had thought going in to that whole situation that I was not being direct enough with that senior executive, and that was the problem. But that actually wasn't the problem at all. The issue was that he wanted data and numbers in a very specific format, and he wanted social proof, basically other leaders buying into the idea to help influence him. So I took this information and I mimicked my colleagues' behaviors by trying the same things with the senior executive and I got better results. However, I didn't feel that I was really using my own approach as well and as much as I would have liked. So I modified some of the things I learned from him to suit myself and my own approach better. And I tried that out. Now, this is the modeling part. And I kept trying it out until I was satisfied with my results. Now, it's important to note, as you're looking through this whole process of case study and experimenting by trying these different things, that there might be variables going on that could be outside of your control. Maybe my colleague had a leg up in the situation because he was male in a male-dominated industry. And perhaps this male executive that I was trying to work with might have an issue with women. So that's a possible variable to explore. So my next set of observations might be to find a woman to study who is also able to influence this executive and see what she does and see if the same pattern of behaviors holds true for her. This has to be said. You can also look at the idea of mimicking and modeling from a cautionary tale standpoint. You look at what doesn't work so you don't make the same mistakes. Now, it's important here to say you don't want to mimic what somebody else did if it totally blew up in their face, but you can look at maybe you were doing some of the same things and what can you model sort of in retrospect to say, this is what this person did. Maybe I should try the opposite thing to see what worked. Before we get into the basic framework for how we do this mimicking and modeling, note, please, that a certain behavior is not necessarily going to work in all situations. This idea of a one behavior fits all scenarios is is unlikely. But once you've mindfully created your new model, You can modify that model as needed to fit in different situations. So here is the basic framework for how to do mimicking and modeling mindfully. Number one, identify a person you admire. And to keep ourselves sane and unstressed, we're going to focus on one person. Then number two. Ask a specific question to research. What is it about this person that I admire? Don't try to answer the question yet. Just be clear on what you're going to study. Number three, do your research. This can look like a lot of things. Again, don't try to answer the questions before you do your research or let ideas influence you to the point where you don't see what may actually be happening. Look at that whole behavioral ecosystem. Their success may be based on something you don't realize is affecting the outcome. So don't let your factory default settings block you from seeing what works. Number four, here's a little hint on how to do this effectively. You can use the acronym STAR as an example of how to look at their behaviors. Now, for those of you who listened to last season's episodes on behavioral interviewing, It's the same STAR acronym, situation or task, action, and result. That will help to give you that fuller picture of the behavioral ecosystem. What situation or task were they trying to deal with? What actions did they take? And what were their results? 
Step number five is to mimic. See what works and what doesn't through your own practice of copying the behaviors of this other person. This really comes down to an experiment and sort of pulling apart the strands of what someone is doing and just trying it out. Then, of course, our final step, step six, is the modeling step. What doesn't work, tweak or modify. If it doesn't feel natural or comfortable or right for you, you can get rid of it or make it work for yourself. What does work, keep it. And then you morph these behaviors into your own ecosystem to start getting different results going forward. Now, step seven cycles back up to step one because step seven is rinse and repeat. You keep trying out different behaviors, keep trying new things. Maybe you want to continue along the same vein. Let's say if you're working on, you know, owning the room when you uh, have to present Um, maybe you find a different person that you admire and follow through the same process again, or perhaps you're ready to move on to a whole different skill set. All right, everyone. So that is mimicking and modeling mindfully. That's a mouthful. It is now time for last call. In the next week, maybe two weeks, if you have a lot going on, I would like for you to think about a person you admire. Dig down to one question you want to research through some mimicking and modeling and spend 15 minutes observing the person however you can, either in person, on video, or even by reading about them. Don't underestimate the power of focus when you're working through this mimicking and modeling process. 15 minutes of focus on behavior and that situation, task, action, result, looking at that behavioral ecosystem is going to really glean a lot of information for you. And then identify one thing that they did that you can mimic or try out this week. So I would love to hear from you if you have uh, any mimicking that you've tried Uh, that you've had some success with, or maybe something that just felt super awkward that you would like to share with our other listeners, please let me know. And I will talk to you all soon. Bye. Well, thanks for joining me. If you have suggestions, feedback, or just something random you want to share, email me at careerspeakeasy at gmail.com and come visit again soon. Cheers. If the pandemic lockdown has made you aware of some major changes you want to make in your career or life, I can help. Maybe you realize you hate your current job or that you're holding yourself back from making a big life change that deep down you really want. Now is the time to start building momentum for the future. I've spent my career in professional development and training at Fortune 100 companies, leading training initiatives and coaching people from frontline employees to executive level leaders to improve their relationship to their work, their colleagues, and themselves. If you think some non-judgmental support and gentle nudging would help to get you going, give me a call to discuss one-on-one coaching and consulting. If your organization or company is ready for an injection of new ideas, energy, and practical tools to improve company culture and efficiency, let's chat. I have off-the-shelf workshops ready to bring to your organization on topics like effective communication, change management, presentation skills, and a suite of leadership development workshops, just to name a few. Custom workshops are also an option. For a 30-minute complimentary consultation, email me at kelly.nottingham at gmail.com, go to kellynottingham.com, or reach out to me on LinkedIn or via the links in the podcast notes so we can see if I'm a good fit for your needs.